Welcome to a world where nothing is as it seems. Welcome to Fake Britain. Get down! Get down! On the floor now! Put your hands behind your back now! Here at the Fake Britain House, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous, and we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, the fake sports memorabilia that could lose you thousands. It's wonderful, you know, it's signed by this player, it's signed by that player. They're all fake. The fake debt collectors who just want your money. They promise to recover your debt. That happened in no case at all. The fake blenders that could cause a fire in your home. It's in the lap of the gods whether or not this thing catches fire, explodes. And the fakers cashing in on the latest running trend. I had a little bit of a panic. I thought, goodness me, I've spent over £150 in their fake. This boxing glove is signed, it appears, by Muhammad Ali and had a price tag of nearly £1,000 because it was on sale as having belonged to the former heavyweight champion of the world. But if I'd paid big money for this, I'd have taken a big hit because this glove and all of this memorabilia is fake. The memorabilia fakers are punching above their weight and the problem is getting worse. It's daybreak. A major operation is underway to catch one of the many fakers out there thought to be selling vast quantities of fake sporting memorabilia to members of the public. The officers have no idea what to expect when raiding a property, so the police are providing some heavy duty backup. Trading standards officer Neil Martin kicked off the operation after buying this football shirt which the seller claimed had been signed by a rather famous Manchester United striker. Uh, we did a test purchase of a signed Wayne Rooney shirt, which cost £150. Um, we subsequently had the signature examined by Wayne Rooney himself, who said, that's not my signature. So what, in effect, they've done is added uh, £100 value to the shirt by providing the signature. It's thought the suspected faker has raked in over a million pounds by selling fake memorabilia. When the officers arrive at the address, it's not the warmest of welcomes. Hi, my name's Neil Martin from Trading Standards in Dorset. You just leave the door open. You just leave the door open. On this occasion, the battering ram can stay where it is. The officers are quickly inside the property where they find the man they believe is selling fake signed football merchandise. Do you know why we're here? OK, right. The reason we've come here is we made a test purchase of a signed football shirt, which yeah. has been confirmed as being a fake signature. What we want to have a look at is your business records and stocks that you keep. The search gets underway, and the officers soon discover what could be a major fake memorabilia operation. In the property itself, there's an office set up at the back of the house. In that is a computer and various cabinets containing blank shirts that, that don't bear any signatures. Soon, the officers emerge with boxes and boxes of evidence that could suggest a roaring trade in the fake signatures of famous footballers. We've got bags and bags of blank shirts. They're genuine shirts, but unsigned shirts. If we hadn't have taken them from him, I suspect what would have happened is orders would have come in, he would have applied the fake signatures to these shirts, increased their value by, you know, a hundred pounds plus. Boots as well. Again, these are blanks. Also, footballs. We've got um, probably 60 or 70 uh, footballs, again, waiting to be signed. The officers even find a stash of pens that might have been used to sign the merchandise. Sharpie pens, these are sort of the industry standard for signed memorabilia. We recovered a fairly significant quantity of these pens. The officers also seize electronic evidence that could point to a fake memorabilia factory being run from this suburban home. 
been able to seize a number of computer items, a tower. In fact, there's three towers have been seized and telephones also. The evidence that we will actually be able to retrieve off of these computers will go a long way to actually uh, securing hopefully a, a successful conviction at court at a later date. It's a huge success for trading standards, with 26 bags of evidence, including over 60 blank football shirts seized. But this might not be the last case of fake memorabilia that Neil has to deal with. Fake memorabilia has been around for as long as famous people have been around. Um, particularly sports memorabilia seems to be very popular. You can get a blank shirt, you can fake a signature on it and make significant sums of money from it. So it's on the increase, uh, we're finding it more and more. Coming up, we meet the people who thought they were buying the real thing, but who've lost thousands of pounds on fake collector's items. I've spent about £9,000. It's devastating, really, because all of a sudden you've got, you've got a room full of stuff that's it's not worth anything. And the trading standards officer who brought one of the fakers to justice. They basically are not worth the paper they're printed on. What do you do if someone owes you money and refuses to pay? Well, you could hire a debt recovery service to get your money, like these guys, Barclay Collection Management. Barclay. Sounds good, doesn't it? Like the bank. I can rest assured they'll get my money back in no time. But despite appearances, they won't. It's a fake company, and as we've discovered, they've fooled a lot of people and swindled them out of tens of thousands of pounds. John Thorpe used to run a successful kitchen design and fitting business based in Huddersfield. He'd had the company for 20 years and things were going well. I'd run such a successful business for all these years uh, with big contracts for lots and lots of different clients and I had a good reputation. On one particular job, a customer refused to pay for work that John's company had done. John was owed £11,500, and the huge debt was causing him serious cash flow problems. But then, one day, a solution presented itself out of the blue. And we got a couple of factors sent over two or three days saying, Barclays, debt collection company, can we help? It seemed fantastic that somebody were going to help us get that money back. So I gave them a ring. The company, Barclay Collection Management, promised to be able to reclaim unpaid debts within six weeks. There are legitimate debt collection companies out there helping people to get their money back. And because this one was using the names Barclay and Barclays, just like the bank, John thought he was dealing with a household name. I thought it was Barclays Bank. Never thought to check out that it wouldn't be anybody else, but... I don't expect somebody else using somebody else's name, like a bank. Barclay Collection Management sent a representative to meet John and his partner to discuss their case. He persuaded them to sign up to the service and pay an upfront fee. I think it was about £1,500 or something to start with. And you think, well, that's a lot of money, but he tried to justify it by his own costs cost for this and cost for that, and they were asking for quite a lot of money in the beginning. John was told that he'd get his £1,500 upfront fee back, as the costs would be recovered from the other side. But over the course of the next few months, the company asked John for more and more money, even though nothing ever seemed to get done. You could more or less say about £1,000 a time, which stretched over about eight, nine months. Overall, John paid out over seven and a half thousand pounds to the company, hoping to get his debt repaid. He was struggling financially, but all of a sudden, he got the news he'd been waiting for. The debt company called and told him the client had finally paid his debt and the money was ready to hand over. But there was a catch. I had to pay an insurance cost of 1,500 pounds to, to cover their costs, and I was at the bank, ready to pay the money in. Luckily, at that very moment, John had a phone call from a concerned family member who thought John might have been targeted by fraudsters. I had a phone call on my mobile to say, don't pay this money. You must not pay this money. John realised the very people he trusted were the ones he should have feared. 
but he wasn't the only person to be conned. Over at Northwest Trading Standards, Officer Walter Din was receiving other complaints about the debt recovery company. We first became aware of the allegations of fraud uh, after a gentleman in Coventry was defrauded out of, uh, I think, a total of £8,000. It was thought the debt recovery company was fake. They promised to recover your debt in full within a period of either six or 12 weeks. That happened in no case at all that we managed to find. Walter investigated further, and the trail led him to Samira Sadiq and her brother, Muhammad Ali. It's true to say that Samira Sadiq was the brains of the outfit, and she day to day used to call the shots. Ali operated as a representative and Sadiq would deploy Ali to the victims. The siblings hooked their victims by churning out hundreds of thousands of faxes every day, containing false information about their fake company. They had fax servers, and those servers are capable of generating between 18 and 100,000 unsolicited fax messages a night. So businesses and libraries, community centers, pubs and clubs were being absolutely inundated by these messages. Walter needed hard evidence, and so he turned to John for help. He arranged for John to set up a phone call with the debt recovery company and secretly recorded the conversation. Go to the kitchens. Hi, is that Yeah, who's that? Stacey, Stacey the Barclays Oh, I love you, yeah. The woman reminded John he just needed to make a final payment of £1,800 and the money he was owed would be released. What happened is he's paid into like a holding account. He's paid a majority of it. If you get this sorted by today, say lunchtime, you get your payment in. It's as simple as that. There was no holding account. The debtor had not paid a penny. It was a complete pack of lies. John had become a target of a type of advance fee fraud, which is when fraudsters persuade victims to make advance or upfront payments for goods and services that never materialise. It's one of the most common types of confidence tricks, claiming thousands of victims each year. In John's case, Trading Standards suspected the woman on the phone was ringleader, Samira Sadiq, but she'd given herself a fake name on the phone. Trading Standards took the recording of the phone call to forensic speech consultant, Dr Richard Rhodes. He analysed the voice of the female caller and compared it with a recording of Samira Sadiq taken during a police interview. Miss Sadiq has uh, quite an unusually creaky voice, and the person's voice and speech patterns were extremely similar to those of Samira Sadiq, and that was actually very strong evidence that it was Miss Sadiq. The huge scale of the fraud being carried out by Sadiq and her brother was about to unravel. Around 100 people had lost money to the fake debt recovery company, with one victim losing over £44,000 to the pair. It's difficult to estimate. They didn't keep any business records, so it could be a quarter of a million, half a million pounds worth of losses in total. Finally, there was enough evidence to prosecute both Samira Sadiq and her brother, Mohammed. Sadiq pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud and her brother pleaded guilty to defrauding one victim out of £80,000. But there may be no justice for those taken in by their con. There is little chance of recovery of the money. We think it's gone overseas and it's a difficult matter to recover that. The victims have, I'm afraid, lost their money. John paid out seven and a half thousand pounds to the fakers on top of the 11 and a half thousand pounds he was already owed. All of which he'd expected to see come back. But it never came back. He had to close down his company. He had to let eight employees go. John's former showroom has since been taken over by another business. Very upset, and it was very hard having to shut down and tell people. And I think it's one of the worst things you can be in as, as a scam like that. This gadget might help you get healthier. Because its powerful motor is supposed to pulverise fruit and veg to create more wholesome drinks. What this one is actually doing, though, I'm not sure. It's a fake. This is the real thing, the Nutribullet. It's become the latest must-have kitchen gadget. And 
Look, they're virtually identical, except while this might be good for you, the fake here might be very bad. It's a UK phenomenon. Health-conscious Brits have gone mad for blenders, especially ones like the Nutribullet. Its inventors say its powerful motor helps to release more nutrients than a regular blender. And a million of them have been sold in the UK alone. This technology cracks through the stems and busts open cores and seeds so it's fully broken down. Katrina Blake from West Yorkshire was hoping to lose some weight by using a blender to eat more healthily. We're doing some renovations at home, so we're eating a lot of fast food. And I thought this seemed a good way to get my fibre day and get some fruit and veg into myself and my husband, who doesn't really like eating fruit and vegetables. Katrina went online to find a good deal and bought one for £75. When it arrived, she couldn't wait to get started. I was getting ready for work one morning and I prepared all my fruit and vegetables um, and put the Nutribullet on. Literally, I was 30 seconds, I ran upstairs to grab my bag. I came back downstairs and my husband was shouting in the kitchen. So Katrina rushed in to see what the problem was. I thought the house was on fire. There was such a smell of, of fresh smoke. There was smoke coming out of the bottom of the Nutribullet. The kitchen was filling with smoke and Katrina had to act quickly. I just kept thinking, it's going to blow up, it's going to set the tea towel on fire that sat at the side of it. So I quickly unplugged it and took it outside. Katrina had narrowly escaped what might have been a catastrophic house fire. She tried to contact the seller but got nowhere, so instead she got in touch with High Street TV, Nutribullet's official UK distributor. They asked her to send in some photos of her blender, and she was shocked when it was revealed that it was a fake. I thought if I bought something, I thought it'd be real and legitimate. I couldn't believe it. Andrew Melcher is the boss of High Street TV. Katrina's fake isn't the first one he's heard about. Unfortunately, a number of consumers now contact us with the disappointing news that they have indeed purchased a fake product. Good afternoon, you're free to High Street TV. Speaking to Adam, how can I help you today? His company's call centre is inundated with calls from disgruntled customers who've bought fakes. And that number is increasing all the time. We have hundreds on a monthly basis. Andrew showed us the difference between the fake units and the genuine item. So here we have some examples. We have items here that look like original Nutribullets, yet one of them is in fact a counterfeit. And the telltale signs are, for example, if we turn the unit to the back, first of all, what we'll see here is a number of certification marks, whereas the counterfeit unit doesn't have them at all. It's not been safety checked in any way, and it's an illegal unit. The unit itself is actually heavier than the counterfeit unit. It's a lot lighter. So if we check that out, we'll find there it's around 1950 grams. We then take the counterfeit item and you can specifically see that it's about 200 grams less in weight and that's because the motor inside that is an inferior motor which has not passed safety standards. And the fakes are just as bad on the inside. So what we see here, for example, this is a very, very high quality piece of steel, whereas this unit, upon even touching it, you can feel that it's an inferior quality on the counterfeit. Fake Nutribullets aren't just being sold online, they're also for sale on the high street. And back in the call centre, they've received information that suspected fake blenders are being sold to shoppers in central London. Jennifer Farries from High Street TV is going to check it out. We've been tipped off that there is a guy selling counterfeit Nutribullets, so I'm about to go and purchase one and see if they're real or not. Soon Jennifer's back with her purchase. Time to see if it's a fake. I've just purchased the Nutribullet from the stall, and at first glance, you can easily be fooled into thinking that it is a genuine Nutribullet, but I can tell instantly from the packaging that it's not real. From first looking at it, I can tell again that it's not real because of the tacky plastic bottom. You wouldn't get that on the genuine Nutribullet. And if I actually pull the entire device out, on the back, you should have safety marks on here again, that you'd find on a genuine Nutribullet, which, again, aren't on here. 
And that was easily picked up, literally, just at a stall on a busy high street in London. The fake blenders are clearly selling well. So while I was inside purchasing one for myself, there was three other customers behind me also buying one for themselves. He's obviously doing great businesses with, with this. However, you can't guarantee that these counterfeit Nutribullets are safe. There are concerns that these machines are dangerous. So Fake Britain took a fake blender to independent safety expert Steve Kirtler from Electrical Safety First. Steve will simulate a fault to put the fake to the test. Well, the test that we're going to apply to the fake neutral bullet is one that's foreseeable condition where um, a fruit stone or something locks the motor and then the motor will start to heat up when the motor overheats, a built-in safety feature should shut the blender down in order to prevent any injury or fire risk. The test gets underway, but the blender's not shutting down. Things are obviously getting very warm very quickly. And Steve is concerned about the smoke. The bit that you can't see is the toxic fumes that are being released from the damage being caused by the heat, and it really does get to the back of your throat to the point where you know it feels like you can't breathe. And if this was in your kitchen, letting off those fumes, it would be a, a, a serious hazard. This fake has definitely failed the safety tests, but it's not the worst that Steve has seen. We've proved today that out of the test samples we've got, the fake neutral bullet is unsafe, but we've had far more dramatic results and more hazardous results in the past of testing. With potentially flammable fakes like this one on sale on the high street, Steve Kirtler is concerned. The main issue you're looking at here is something overheating without the right protection. It's just in the lap of the gods whether or not this thing catches fire, explodes. So that's the main issue with these, is that it could cause a serious fire. Earlier on Fake Britain, we followed police and trading standards, cracking down on a suspected memorabilia faker. We've got bags and bags of blank shirts. Whether it's to do with sports or pop music, collectible memorabilia is now a multi-million pound industry, popular with teenage fans and adult collectors alike. At this established and reputable memorabilia fair in Kensington, Big money changes hands for celebrity signed merchandise. But fake memorabilia of all sorts is on the rise, with people across the country losing hundreds and in some cases thousands of pounds. Jane Boddy from Hampshire is a lifelong Manchester United fan and loves to buy anything to do with her club or her heroes. My parents left me some money when they died and I was debating on what to do with it. I wanted to use it for something so it would help me remember them. And I thought, what better than my passion for football? I love football. So I thought, I'll buy as much as I can. And then I found Steve. That was when I started spending a lot of money. The Steve in question was Steve Pearson. He'd risen through the local community to become a stadium announcer at Portsmouth Football Club. He scored the goal! So, He's got his goal tonight! <laughs> Pearson opened a shop selling sporting memorabilia. He was fast gaining local celebrity status and Jane was impressed. Steve was a brilliant person. He went into the shop, he was chatty and friendly and gave you cups of tea and talked very knowledgeable about you know, football. And so everything that he sold you, you'd think, oh, it's wonderful, you know, it's signed by this player, it's signed by that player. Jane couldn't resist. She was drawn in by Pearson's seemingly encyclopedic knowledge of sporting memorabilia. Before long, she was spending vast sums of money in the shop. I've spent about £9,000 plus on, um, like, for instance, my Bobby Moore shirt, Maradona, a Messi shirt, Cruyff, Cantona programmes as well. I've got some 1968s. European final programme, and that's got four signets on, on it, which looks wonderful. At first glance, everything that Jane was spending thousands of pounds of her inheritance on did look wonderful. Suddenly, she got a call from Trading Standards. Jane was about to discover that Pearson and his glossy signed sports memorabilia were not all they appeared to be. 
somebody in form trading standards that I thought Steve Pearson was selling fake goods. Thought, um, you know, there's probably just somebody's got a gripe against Steve or something. I was still going down the shop you know, once or twice a week. And then I suddenly realised the second time he came round and warned me not to go down the shop anymore, I realised then I was in trouble. <laughs> Trading Standards Service, Craig Copen speaking. The Portsmouth Trading Standards Officer who'd called Jane was Craig Copeland. Craig had been getting some very worrying phone calls about Steve Pearson and the signed memorabilia that he was selling. The allegations against him were that they were either purchased counterfeit goods that he was selling off as genuine or that he was actually um, creating this, these, um, these signatures on the products. Pearson was selling all sorts of memorabilia out of two high street shops to everyone from collectors spending thousands to teenagers spending their pocket money. So here we are at uh, what used to be Hall of Fame. It's now perfectly legitimate business uh, being operated out of here, but this was the place where our victims would come. They feel like part of a club. They, you know, they, they, were, they were drawn in by his stories of his days at Fratton Park. Allegations about Steve Pearson selling fake memorabilia were now flooding in. It was time for Trading Standards to draft in an expert opinion. So they turned to leading autograph and memorabilia specialist, Gary King. His knowledge of memorabilia, both real and fake, has helped to bring dozens of prosecutions and even put one fraudster behind bars. Gary believes that fake memorabilia is rife across the country. Fake memorabilia is, uh, is a serious problem, in particular in the sports world. Uh, signed shirts, photographs, that sort of thing. It's a massive, massive problem for anybody if you're a collector or if you're a dealer. There's so many, so many items out there that are just absolute rubbish. It was up to Gary to examine Jane's football memorabilia and to break some very bad news. Yes. He's certainly not Peter Shilton. No. And that is definitely not Bobby Charlton. If you put the signatures of footballing legends really Peter Shilton, yeah. Bobby Charlton, yeah. Ronaldinho. But I would say that that is not authentic. Look. All of them fake. Gary established that Jane's rare signed programme from the 1968 Euro Cup final, which should have been worth up to £300 if genuine, was not what it seemed. It, what a collector's item, I thought. Unfortunately, this too is also fake. None of them are original signatures. They're, uh, they're all fake. Jane is fascinated by Bobby Moore, the England captain who famously held the World Cup aloft after England's 1966 win. So her biggest purchase from Pearson was a signed Bobby Moore shirt. I'm very proud of this. It was out of my hall. It's like a holy grail, really. And then you find... No, it's, uh, it's not Bobby Moore. £650 plus 150 for the frame. It was a fake shirt. And now I've got a house full of stuff that's, that's no use to anybody now. It's, it's devastating, really. Jane had unwittingly surrounded herself with fake memorabilia worth far less than she paid for it. But at least one good thing was to come out of this. Gary King's analysis of the fakes gave Craig and the team at Portsmouth Trading Standards enough evidence to finally raid Steve Pearson's property. They were shocked by the scale of what they found. Over 100 items of fake signed memorabilia. And not just football. This is uh, a glove um, containing the signature of Muhammad Ali. Um, it's definitely not the signature of Muhammad Ali. Uh, we found one of these uh, on sale uh, in his shop for £900. It's a massive amount, and uh, anybody who's going to part with that much money to, to, to get an item like this, I mean, is going to be absolutely devastated. And it turns out that Steve Pearson was also into his music. So here we've got a uh, guitar which is uh, supposedly signed by three members of Queen, so that would be uh, John Deacon, Roger Taylor and Brian May. This is uh, definitely not a legitimate item. These signatures are, are fake signatures. Pearson's fakery even infected the certificates of authenticity that came with the memorabilia to fool people into thinking it was the real deal. 
they basically uh, outline that he's purchasing only from reputable dealers, um, that he's a member of a trade organisation. Uh, and this, of course, is, is completely not the case. He has no, no expertise in the industry. He's never been a member of the trade associations that he claimed to be. Uh, and these are not worth the paper they're printed on. Pearson had fooled dozens of collectors with his fake memorabilia. But he wasn't just targeting superfans. He was also targeting investors. Jim Conway from Portsmouth invests in rare memorabilia. He collects everything from cars to guitars. In total, with Steve Pearson, I, I approximately spent six, seven thousand um, over five years. I was spending not only just to build up a nice collection, but later on it would it would be my pension money, and one day I'll say, "Oh, I'll sell it now and and get a nice lump back." Um, ho hopefully, it was going to go up in value. See what you got. As an expert witness in the case, Gary had to examine some of the memorabilia that Jim bought from Steve Pearson. But he hasn't yet seen everything. Today, he's visiting Jim to see if he might be able to bring some good news. Let's have a look. Well, that's not Tiger Woods. I don't recall seeing an item signed by Tiger Woods where he's also added good luck. No, it's not, it's not authentic. Gary also examines this apparently rare photograph signed by John Lennon. Now, how much did you pay for this? Uh, about 200. 200 pounds. It's printed. As a print, it's probably something you could buy on, you know, in a shop somewhere for nothing more than mm. 10 pounds. Wow. Well, Sorry about that. Mm. Really am. Because I know, I know how much people get attached to, you know, to these things. And then, sadly, you find out the, the truth. Yeah. Unfortunately, when it's too late. Right. But Jim hasn't only bought memorabilia from Steve Pearson over the years. He's been an investor for decades and bought a range of signed electric guitars from other sellers before he even knew about Steve Pearson. During filming, Gary spots them and decides to take a closer look. This one is meant to be the Rolling right. Stones. So we've got Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Ronnie Wood. This is Charlie Watts mm. and I honestly have no idea who that one is meant to be at right. all. OK. But they are not authentic. That was signed in somebody's bedroom. And this one here, mm -hmm. this one's pink, Yeah. but it's not Pink Floyd. They are very difficult to get signatures from. Right. Dave Gilmore, in particular, is a very tough signature to get. He doesn't like signing things like this. He knows you're going to sell it. Shockingly, these aren't the only unexpected fakes in Jim's collection. Bruce, Cliff, the Eagles, they're all fake. I expected Steve Pearson's to be fake because of the nature of the investigation and the court case. But obviously, I didn't expect these to be fake, which yeah, never un even came Unfortunately, through. Steve Pearson is not the only person well, I'm, who's I know, faking yeah. this stuff and, and then yeah. selling it online. Yeah. It's very, very easy for people to yeah. do. That's the problem. It's upsetting, isn't it? Wow. Well. Yeah, yeah, I'm not collecting them, more. not interested. Yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let it put yeah. you off. Yes, it'll be the last ones I'll buy. It has put me off collecting, yeah. you know, because there's so many unscrupulous people out there. And as I said, I thought Steve Pearson was a friend, but obviously he was just lying in his own pockets. Steve Pearson eventually pleaded guilty to 13 counts of fraud and was ordered to pay over £2,500 compensation to his victims. He was sentenced to 14 months in prison, suspended for two years, and given 200 hours community service. But it will take Jim and Jane longer than that to get over their loss. It's the fact he's got me, it's the fact he's done everybody else. Um, what are you feeling right now? Upset with him, angry with him. You're just kind of shattered because all of a sudden you've got, you've got a room full of stuff that's it's not worth anything. The amount of money that I've lost will always be with me. This looks a bit like a strange glove, but it's actually a running shoe, so thin that it apparently feels like running in bare feet. It's called the Vibram Five Fingers. The inventors of this so-called barefoot running shoe think it gives runners a more natural running experience, but 
you would do better to leave this one in your locker because it's fake. And as we're about to find out, running in this could cause injury. Running, love it or hate it, over 10 million of us do it regularly, whether it's trotting to the shops or training for a triathlon. And trainers are big business, forming a global industry worth over £40 billion. As we've seen on Fake Britain, the fakers are after some of those profits. Here at London Thamesport in Kent, officers intercepted a suspect shipment. We've done some paperwork checks on two containers that arrived last week. The goods inside them may be counterfeit. Fake trainers were thought to be inside these boxes. You can see how far back it goes. About 4,000 boxes in this container. It was confirmed that the boxes contained high-end fake trainers. Here we have a Tiger brand trainer. Uh, the container's full of these, about 4,000 pairs. As you can see, it's very good quality. I think that's a good fake. In the second container, the officers found other different brands of high-end fakes. These are Adidas trainers, very high quality. They look like the genuine article, um, but the mark holder has confirmed that they are, in fact, counterfeit goods. Shoes, including trainers, are one of the most faked products in the world. So like a brand again. Many of the fakes enter the country through major ports like this one. And this huge interception was a big win for the authorities. We have about 9,000 pairs of trainers here that have come in from Hong Kong. We're now certain that they are counterfeit goods. Either Adidas or Tiger brand, both of which are very desirable brands. With 9,000 pairs, that's obviously a considerable amount of money. But a new type of running shoe has emerged onto the market, the barefoot running shoe. And so fakers are now turning their attention to the billion pound barefoot running industry. They're focusing on shoes like the Vibram Five Fingers, as Alison Beadle from South London discovered. I initially got into barefoot training shoes about four or five years ago. I got a bit hooked and I've been wearing them ever since. Alison has got six pairs of barefoot running shoes, one for every occasion, if you like. These are for use for kind of studio in the gym. These are my latest ones. They're slightly thicker at the bottom. And then these are probably the most comfortable ones. They're more like my slip-on casual shoe. Alison teaches personal fitness and barefoot running. She gets through a lot of running shoes. When she needed a new pair, she went online to find a good deal. It looked a fairly decent website. It had um, lots of different types of really kind of ones that I didn't have as well, so I was kind of a little bit excited. Alison went ahead and ordered three pairs of shoes for about £150, a good saving on the full price. The package arrived and she couldn't wait to try on the new running shoes, but the delivery wasn't what she expected. I was a little confused at first because they weren't the ones I ordered in the first place. So the colours were different, the styles were different. On closer inspection, Alison realised it was more than just the colours she needed to worry about. I thought, let me put it on my feet and let my feet see how they feel about it. They were too big, they didn't fit across the top of the foot, they were wide around the toes. And you could see the stitching. They were kind of baggy, they were baggy around the ankle, they were baggy around the top of the foot, and they felt absolutely terrible. Alison had to go back to running around in her old shoes, but she was annoyed at having wasted £150 of her money. So she decided to send photos of them to the shoe's UK distributor, Primal Lifestyle. And within hours, they'd literally rattled off a letter stating that these were um, fake Vibrams. I'd also ordered some for a friend and she'd paid me as well. So then I thought, oh, I've wasted my friend's money as well. So I had a little bit of a panic. I thought, goodness me, I've, I've spent over £150 in there, fake. After showing evidence of her fake purchase, Alison was finally able to get a refund from her bank. But there are thousands more fakes out there, leaving runners across the country hundreds of pounds out of pocket at a time. We spoke to Jerome Sickard from brand protection company Mark Monitor. 
His investigations have uncovered fakery of Vibrams on a huge scale, potentially affecting thousands of customers. The first few weeks of uh, policing the internet for, for, for these guys, we closed down in excess of 120 individual websites that sold counterfeited Vibrams. We've removed 300,000 products almost. It doesn't take long for Jerome to hunt down the sites selling fake running shoes. So just today, uh, we found a new website. Uh, the domain name is in .co.uk, so clearly targeting the UK market. And when you look at the products, the first price that is offered to you is dollars, the shipping and return information. So you probably copied that directly from uh, Vibram's legitimate site. All those things together tell you that clearly a counterfeit website and uh, definitely one of those uh, that we will take down for Vibram. Fake Britain went online and bought one of the many pairs of fake Vibrams on sale. We showed them to the Italian inventor of the original barefoot running shoe, Robert Fleury. He compared them to the genuine article. If you watch the original, we have a really flexible sole, like a second skin allows to grab the ground, which is the main feature of the, what the feet can do in five finger shoes. But what does he make of the fake shoes we bought online? In the case of the fakes, the sole is really stiff, so you almost cannot bend this toe. This doesn't provide nothing more than a five-toed shoe. The whole thing, it's not balanced. Nobody spent time on making this. It's just to mimic as good as possible the look of the original one. But what might the fake shoes do to your feet if you run in them? Matt Walden from the Shoes UK distributor agreed to put our fake shoes through their paces. So this is a bit kind of loose, so it's more difficult to get the toes in, but... If he can ever get them on, that is. Need a bit of a hole in that, in fact, two holes in that one, just by pulling it on, and it's quite baggy round here. The fakes are already disintegrating, but what do they feel like to run in? Around the toes, there was some discomfort, particularly around the second and third toes on both feet, actually. It didn't, didn't feel nearly as nice. I imagine it would be a very quick process to get blisters in multiple places from these, uh, these fake shoes. The danger of injury to feet from fake barefoot running shoes is very real. Fake Britain was contacted by a member of the public who sent us photos of his fake Vibrams. They were so bad they actually made his feet bleed. For Matt and Robert, fake Vibrams are an insult to the years of hard work and investment that have gone into producing the real thing. I feel bad if people are not getting what they are looking for because somebody's just trying to make money out of it. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.